Autoeroticism, a study of the spontaneous manifestations of the sexual impulse, part one, section one of studies in the psychology of sex, volume one, by Havelock Ellis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christopher Most. Autoeroticism, a study of the spontaneous manifestations of the sexual impulse, part one, section one. By autoeroticism I mean the phenomena of spontaneous sexual emotion generated in the absence of an external stimulus proceeding, directly or indirectly, from another person. In a wide sense, which cannot be wholly ignored here, autoeroticism may be said to include those transformations of repressed sexual activity, which are a factor of some morbid conditions as well as of the normal manifestation of art and poetry, and indeed, more or less color the whole life. Such a definition excludes the normal sexual excitement aroused by the presence of a beloved person of the opposite sex. It also excludes the perverted sexuality associated with an attraction to the person of the same sex. It further excludes the manifold forms of erotic fetishism, in which the normal focus of sexual attraction is displaced, and voluptuous emotions are aroused only by some object, hair, shoes, garments, etc., which, to the ordinary lover, are of subordinate, though still indeed considerable, importance. The autoerotic field remains extensive. It ranges from occasional voluptuous daydreams, in which the subject is entirely passive, to the perpetual unashamed efforts at sexual self-manipulation witnessed among the insane. It also includes, though chiefly as curiosities, those cases in which individuals fall in love with themselves. Among autoerotic phenomena, or on the borderland, we must further include those religious sexual manifestations for an ideal object, of which we may find evidence in the lives of saints and ecstatics. The typical form of autoeroticism is the occurrence of the sexual orgasm during sleep. I do not know that any apology is needful for the invention of the term autoerotism. There is no existing word in current use to indicate the whole range of phenomena I am here concerned with. We are familiar with masturbation, but that, strictly speaking, only covers a special and arbitrary subdivision of the field, although, it is true, the subdivision with which physicians and alienists have chiefly occupied themselves. Self-abuse is somewhat wider, but by no means covers the whole ground, while for various reasons it is an unsatisfactory term. Onanism is largely used, especially in France, and some writers even include all forms of homosexual connection under this name. It may be convenient to do so from a physiological point of view, but it is a confusing and antiquated mode of procedure, and from the psychological standpoint altogether illegitimate. Onanism ought never to be used in this connection, if only on the ground that Onan's device was not autoerotic, but an early example of withdrawal before emission, or coitus interruptus. While the name that I have chosen may possibly not be the best, there should be no question as to the importance of grouping all these phenomena together. It seems to me that this field has rarely been viewed in a scientifically sound and morally sane light, simply because it has not been viewed as a whole. We have made it difficult so to view it by directing our attention on the special group of autoerotic facts, that group included under masturbation, which was most easy to observe, and which in an extreme form came plainly under medical observation in insanity and allied conditions, and we have willfully torn this group of facts away from the larger group to which it naturally belongs. The questions which have been so widely, so diversely, and, it must unfortunately be added, often so mischievously discussed, concerning the nature and evils of masturbation are not seen in their true light and proportions until we realize that masturbation is but a specialized form of a tendency which in some form or in some degree normally affects not only man, but all higher animals. From a medical point of view, it is often convenient to regard masturbation as an isolated fact, but in order to understand it, we must bear in mind its relationships. In the study of autoerotism I shall frequently have occasion to refer to the old entity of masturbation, because it has been more carefully studied than any other part of the autoerotic field, but I hope it will always be borne in mind that the psychological significance and even the medical diagnostic value of masturbation cannot be appreciated unless we realize that it is an artificial subdivision from a great group of natural facts. The study of autoerotism is far from being an unimportant or merely curious study, yet psychologists, medical and non-medical, almost without exception, treat its manifestations, when they refer to them at all, in a dogmatic and offhand manner which is far from scientific. It is not surprising, therefore, that the most widely divergent opinions are expressed. Nor is it surprising that ignorant and chaotic notions among the general population should lead to results that would be ludicrous if they were not pathetic. To mention one instance known to me. A married lady who is a leader in social purity movements and an enthusiast for sexual chastity discovered, through reading some pamphlet against solitary vice, that she herself had been practicing masturbation for years without knowing it. The profound anguish and hopeless despair of this woman in face of what she believed to be the moral ruin of her whole life cannot be well described. 
it would be easy to give further examples though a scarcely more striking one to show utter confusion into which we are thrown by leaving this matter in the hands of the blind leaders of the blind moreover the conditions of modern civilization render autoerotism a matter of increasing social significance as our marriage rate declines and as illicit sexual relationship continue to be openly discouraged it is absolutely inevitable that autoerotic phenomena of one kind or another not only among women but among men should increase among us both in amount and intensity it becomes therefore a matter of some importance both to the moralist and the physician to investigate the psychological nature of these phenomena and to decide precisely what their attitude should be toward them i do not purpose to enter into a thorough discussion of all the aspects of autoerotism that would involve a very extensive study indeed i wish to consider briefly certain salient points concerning autoerotic phenomenon especially their prevalence their nature and their moral physical and other effects i base my study partly on the facts and opinions which during the last thirty years have been scattered through the periodical and other medical literature of europe and america and partly on the experience of individuals especially of fairly normal individuals among animals in isolation and sometimes in freedom though this can less often be observed it is well known that various forms of spontaneous solitary sexual excitement occur horses when leading a lazy life may be observed flapping the penis until some degree of emission takes place welsh ponies i learn from a man who has had much experience with these animals habitually produce erections and emissions in their stalls they do not bring their hind quarters up during this process and they close their eyes which does not take place when they have congress with mares the same informant observed that bulls and goats produce emissions by using their forelegs as a stimulus, bringing up their hind quarters, and mares rub themselves against objects. I am informed by a gentleman who is a recognized authority on goats that they sometimes take the penis into the mouth and produce actual orgasm, thus practicing autofellatio. As regards ferrets, the Reverend H. Norcote states, I am informed by a gentleman who has had considerable experience of ferrets that if the bitch, when in heat, cannot obtain a dog, she pines and becomes ill. If a smooth pebble is introduced into the hutch, she will masturbate upon it, thus preserving her normal health for one season. But if this artificial substitute is given to her a second season, she will not, as formerly, be content with it. Stags in the rutting season, when they have no partners, rub themselves against trees to produce ejaculation. Sheep masturbate, as also do camels, pressing themselves down against convenient objects, and elephants compress the penis between the hind legs to obtain emissions. Blumenbach observed a bear act somewhat similarly upon seeing other bears coupling, and hyenas, according to Ploss and Bartels, have been seen practicing mutual masturbation by licking each other's genitals. Mammary masturbation, remarks Ferrer, is found in certain female and even male animals, like the dog and cat. Apes are much given to masturbation, even in freedom, according to the evidence of good observers, for while no female apes are celibates, many of the males are obliged to lead a life of celibacy. Male monkeys use the hand in masturbation, to rub and shake the penis. In the human species, these phenomena are by no means found in civilization alone. To whatever extent masturbation may have been developed by the conditions of European life, which carry to the utmost extreme the concomitant stimulation and repression of sexual emotions, it is far from being, as Mantegaza has declared it to be, one of the moral characteristics of Europeans. It is found among the people of nearly every race in which we have any intimate knowledge, however natural the conditions under which men and women may live. Thus, among the Nama Hottentots, among the young women at all events, Gustav Frisch found that masturbation is so common that it is to be regarded the custom of the country. No secret is made of it, and in the stories and legends of the race it is treated as one of the most ordinary facts of life. It is so also among the Basutos, and the Kafirs are addicted to the same habit. The Fugians have a word for masturbation, and a special word for masturbation by women. When the Spaniards first arrived at Vizcaya, in the Philippines, they found that masturbation was universal, and that it was customary for the women to use an artificial penis and other abnormal methods of sexual gratification. Among the Balinese, according to Jacobs, as quoted by Ploss and Bartels, masturbation is general. In the boudoir of many a Bali beauty, he adds, and in every harem, may be found a wax penis to which many hours of solitude are devoted. Throughout the East, as Aram, speaking from a long medical experience, has declared, masturbation is very prevalent, especially among young girls. In Egypt, according to Sonini, it is prevalent in harems. In India, a medical correspondent tells me he once treated the widow of a wealthy Mohammedan, who informed him that she began masturbation at an early age, just like all other women. The same informant tells me that on the facade of a large temple in Orissa are bas reliefs, representing both men and women alone, masturbating, and also women masturbating men. Among the Tamils of Ceylon, masturbation is said to be common. In Cochin, China, Lorian remarks, it is practiced by both sexes, but especially by the married women. 
Japanese women have probably carried the mechanical arts of autoerotism to the highest degree of perfection. They use two hollow balls, about the size of a pigeon's egg, sometimes one alone is used, which, as described by Jost, Christian, and others, are made of very thin leaves of brass. One is empty. The other, called the little man, contains a small heavy metal ball, or else some quicksilver, and sometimes metal tongues which vibrate when set in movement, so that if the balls are held in the hands side by side, there is a continuous movement. The empty one is first introduced into the vagina in contact with the uterus, then the other. The slightest movement of the pelvis or thighs, or even spontaneous movement of the organs, causes the metal ball, or quicksilver, to roll, and the resulting vibration produces a prolonged voluptuous titillation, a gentle shock as from a weak electric inductive apparatus. The balls are called rin no tama, and are held in the vagina by a proper tampon. The women who use these balls delight to swing themselves in a hammock or rocking chair, the delicate vibration of the ball slowly producing the highest degree of sexual excitement. Jost mentions that this apparatus, though well known by name to ordinary girls, is chiefly used by the more fashionable geishas, as well as by prostitutes. Its use has now spread to China, Annam, and India. Japanese women also, it is said, frequently use an artificial penis of paper and clay called engi. Among the Ache, again, according to Jacobs, as quoted by Ploss, the young of both sexes masturbate and the elder girls use an artificial penis of wax. In China, also, the artificial penis, made of rosin, supple, and, like the classical instrument described by Harondas, rose-colored, is publicly sold and widely used by women. It may be noticed that among non-European races it is among women, and especially among those who are subjected to the excitement of a life professionally devoted to some form of pleasure, that the use of the artificial instruments of autoerotism is chiefly practiced. The same is markedly true in Europe. The use of an artificial penis in solitary sexual gratification may be traced down from classic times, and doubtless prevailed in the very earliest human civilization, for such an instrument is said to be represented in old Babylonian sculptures, and it is referred to by Ezekiel, chapter 16, verse 17. The lesbian women are said to have used such instruments, made of ivory or gold, with silken stuffs and linen. Aristophanes, in Lysistrata, verse 109, speaks of the manufacture by Milesian women of leather artificial penis, or lesbos. In the British Museum is a vase representing the Hatira holding such instruments, when, as found at Pompeii, may be seen in the museum at Naples. One of the best of Herondas's mimes, The Private Conversation, presents a dialogue between two ladies concerning a certain Olisbos, which one of them vaunts as a dream of delight. Through the Middle Ages, when from time to time the clergy reprobated the use of such instruments, they continued to be known, and after the fifteenth century the references to them became more precise. Thus Fortini, the Sienese novelist of the sixteenth century, refers in his Novelle del Novisi, Seventh Day, Novella 34, to the glass object filled with warm water which nuns use to calm the sting of the flesh and to satisfy themselves as well as they can. He adds that widows and other women anxious to avoid pregnancy availed themselves of it. In Elizabethan England, at the same time, it appears to have been of a similar character, and Marston, in his satires, tells how Lucia prefers a glassy instrument to her husband's lukewarm bed. In sixteenth-century France, also, such instruments were sometimes made of glass, and Brantome refers to the godmiche. In eighteenth-century Germany they were called Samtanze, and their use, according to Heinz, as quoted by Duren, was common among aristocratic women. In England, by that time, the dildo appears to have become common. Archimholt states that while in Paris they are sold secretly. In London, a certain Mrs. Phillips sold them openly on a large scale in her shop in Leicester Square. John B., in 1835, stating that the name was originally Dill Doll, remarks that their use was formerly commoner than it was in his day. In France, Madame Gordon, the most notorious brothel keeper of the 18th century, carried on a wholesale trade in consolateurs, as they were called, and at her death numberless letters from abbesses and simple nuns were found among her papers, asking for a consolateur to be sent. The modern French instrument is described by Gamier as of hardened red rubber, exactly imitating the penis and capable of holding warm milk or other fluid for injection at the moment of orgasm. The compressible scrotum is said to have been first added in the 18th century. In Islam, the artificial penis has reached nearly as high a development as in Christendom. Turkish women use it, and it is said to be openly sold in Smyrna. In the harems of Zanzibar, according to Bauman, it is of considerable size, carved out of ebony or ivory, and commonly bored so that warm water may be injected. It is here regarded as an Arab invention. Somewhat similar appliances may be traced in all centers of civilization, but throughout they appear to be frequently confined to the world of prostitutes and to those women who live on the fashionable or semi-artistic verge of that world. Ignorance and delicacy combine with a less versatile and perverted concentration on the sexual impulse to prevent any general recourse to such highly specialized methods of solitary gratification. 
On the other hand, the use, or rather abuse, of the ordinary objects and implements of daily life in obtaining autoerotic gratification among the ordinary population in civilized modern lands has reached an extraordinary degree of extent and variety we can only feebly estimate by the occasional resulting mischances which come under the surgeon's hands, because only a certain proportion of such instruments are dangerous. Thus the banana seems to be widely used for masturbation by women, and appears to be marked out for the purpose by its size and shape. It is, however, innocuous, and never comes under the surgeon's notice. The same may probably be said of the cucumbers and other vegetables more especially used by country and factory girls in masturbation. A lady living near Vichy told Polier that she had often heard, and had herself been able to verify the fact, that the young peasant women commonly used turnips, carrots, and beetroots. In the 18th century Mirabeau, in his Erotica Biblion, gave a list of the various objects used in convents, which he describes as vast theatres of such practices, to obtain solitary sexual excitement. In more recent years, the following are a few of the objects found in the vagina or bladder whence they could only be removed by surgical interference. Pencils, sticks of sealing wax, cotton reels, hairpins, and in Italy very commonly the bone pins used in the hair, bodkins, knitting needles, crochet needles, needle cases, compasses, glass stoppers, candles, corks, tumblers, forks, toothpicks, toothbrushes, pomade pots, in a case recorded by Schroeder with a cock chafer inside, a makeshift substitute for the Japanese rin no tama. While in one recent English case, a full-sized hen's egg was removed from the vagina of a middle-aged married woman. More than nine-tenths of the foreign bodies found in the female bladder or urethra are due to masturbation. The age of the individuals in whom such objects has been found is usually from seventeen to thirty, but in a few cases they have been found in girls below fourteen. Infrequently in women between forty and fifty, the large objects, naturally, are found chiefly in the vagina and in married women. Hairpins have, above all, been found in the female bladder with special frequency. This point is worth some consideration as the illustration of the enormous frequency of this form of autoerotism. The female urethra is undoubtedly a normal center of sexual feeling, as Pollier pointed out many years ago. A woman medical correspondent, also, writes that in some women the maximum of voluptuous sensation is at the vesicle sphincter or orifice, though not always so limited. E. H. Smith, indeed, considers that the urethra is the part in which the orgasm occurs, and remarks that in sexual excitement mucus always flows largely from the urethra. It should be added that when once introduced, the physiological mechanism of the bladder apparently causes the organ to tend to swallow the foreign object. Yet for every case in which the hairpin disappears and is lost in the bladder, from carelessness or the oblivion of the sexual spasm, there must be a vast number of cases in which the instrument is used without any such unfortunate result. There is thus great significance in the frequency with which cases of hairpin in the bladder are strewn through medical literature of all countries. In 1862, a German surgeon found the accident so common that he invented a special instrument for extracting the hairpins from the female bladder, as, indeed, Italian and French surgeons also have done. In France, de Nusset of Bordeaux came to the conclusion that hairpin in the bladder is the commonest result of masturbation as known to the surgeon. In England, cases are constantly being recorded. Lawson Tate stating that most cases of stone in the bladder in women are due to the introduction of a foreign body very often a hairpin adds i have removed hairpins encrusted with phosphates from ten different female bladders and not one of the owners of these bladders would give any account of the incident stokes again records that during four years he had four cases of hairpin in the female urethra in new york one physician met with four cases in a short experience in switzerland professor reverdin had a precisely similar experience there is, however, another class of material objects, widely employed for producing physical autoerotism, which in the nature of things never reaches the surgeon. I refer to the effects that, naturally or unnaturally, may be produced by many of the objects and implements of daily life that do not normally come in direct contact with the sexual organs. Children sometimes, even when scarcely more than infants, produce sexual excitement by friction against the corner of a chair or other piece of furniture, and women sometimes do the same. Gutzit, in Russia, knew women who made a large knot in their camisas to rub against, and mentions a woman who would sit on her naked heel and rub it against her. Girls in France, I am informed, are fond of riding on the cheval de bois, or hobby horses, because of the sexual excitement thus aroused, and that the sexual emotions play a part in the fascination exerted by this form of amusement everywhere is indicated by the ecstatic faces of its devotees. At the temples in some parts of central India, I am told, swings are hung up in pairs, men and women swinging in these until sexually excited during the months when the men in these districts have to be away from home, the girls put up swings to console themselves for the loss of their husbands. It is interesting to observe that the very wide prevalence of a swinging, often of a religious or magic character, and the evident sexual significance underlying it, although this is not always clearly brought out. 
Grews, discussing the frequency of swinging, refers, for instance, to the custom of the Gilbert Islanders for a young man to swing a girl from a cocoa palm, and then to cling on and swing with her. In ancient Greece, women and grown-up girls were fond of seesaws and swings. The Athenians had indeed a swinging festival. Songs of a voluptuous character, we gather from the Athenians, were sung by the women at this festival. J. G. Fraser discusses the question and brings forward instances in which men, or especially women, swing. The notion seems to be, he states, that the ceremony promotes fertility, whether in the vegetable or in the animal kingdom. Though why it should be supposed to do so, I confess myself unable to explain. The explanation seems, however, not far to seek in view of the facts quoted above, and Frazier himself refers to the voluptuous character of the song sometimes sung. Even apart from actual swinging of the whole body, a swinging movement may suffice to arouse sexual excitement, and may, at all events in women, constitute an essential part of methods of attaining solitary sexual gratification. Kiernan thus describes the habitual autoerotic procedure of a young American woman. The patient knelt before a chair, let her elbows drop on its seat, grasping the arms with a firm grip, then commenced a swinging, writhing motion, seeming to fix her pelvis, and moving her trunk and limbs. The muscles were rigid, the face took on a passionate expression, the features were contorted, the eyes rolled, the teeth were set, and the lips compressed, while the cheeks remained purple. The condition bore a striking resemblance to the passional stage of grand hysteria. The reveling took only a moment to commence, but lasted a long time. The swaying induced a pleasurable sensation, accompanied with a feeling of suction upon the clitoris. Almost immediately after, a sensation of bursting, caused by discharge from the vulvo-vaginal glands occurs, followed by a rapture prolonged for an indefinite time. The accompanying sexual imagery is so vivid as to become also hallucinatory. J. G. Kiernan, Sex Transformation and Psychic Impotence, American Journal of Dermatology, Volume 9, Number 2. Somewhat similarly sensations of a sexual character are sometimes experienced by boys climbing up a pole. It is not even necessary that there should be direct external contact with the sexual organs, and Howe states that gymnastic swinging poles around which boys swing while supporting the whole weight on the hands may suffice to produce sexual excitement. Several writers have pointed out that the riding, especially in women, may produce sexual excitement and orgasm. It is well known, also, both in men and women, the vibratory motion of a railway train frequently produces a certain degree of sexual excitement, especially when sitting forward. Such excitement may remain latent and not become specifically sexual. I am not aware that this quality of railway traveling has ever been fostered as a sexual perversion, but the sewing machine has attracted considerable attention on account of its influence in exciting autoerotic manifestations. The early type of sewing machine, especially, was of a very heavy character, and involved much up-and-down movement of the legs. Langdon Down pointed out many years ago that this frequently produced some great sexual erethism which has led to masturbation. According to one French authority, it is a well-recognized fact that to work a sewing machine with the body in certain positions produces sexual excitement, leading to orgasm. The occurrence of the orgasm is indicated to the observer by the machine being worked for a few seconds with uncontrollable rapidity. This sound is said to be frequently heard in large French workrooms, and it is a part of the duty of the superintendents to make the girls sit properly. During a visit, which I once paid to a manufactory of military clothing, Pollier writes, I witnessed the following scene. In the midst of the uniform sound produced by some thirty sewing machines, I suddenly heard one of the machines working with much more velocity than the others. I looked at the person who was working it, a brunette of eighteen or twenty. While she was automatically occupied with the trousers she was making on the machine, her face became animated, her mouth opened slightly, her nostrils dilated. Her feet moved the pedals with constantly increasing rapidity. Soon I saw a convulsive look in her eyes. Her eyelids were lowered. Her face turned pale and was thrown backward. Hands and legs stopped and became extended. A suffocated cry, followed by a long sigh, was lost in the noise of the workroom. The girl remained motionless for a few seconds, drew out her handkerchief to wipe away the pearls of sweat from her forehead, and after casting a timid and ashamed glance at her companions, resumed her work. The forewoman, who acted as my guide, having observed the direction of my gaze, took me up to the girl, who blushed, lowered her face, and murmured some incoherent words before the forewoman had opened her mouth to advise her to sit fully on the chair and not sit on its edge. As I was leaving, I heard another machine at another part of the room in accelerated movement. The forewoman smiled at me, and remarked that it was so frequent that it attracted no notice. It was specially observed, she told me, in the case of young work girls, apprentices, and those who sat on the edge of their seats, thus much facilitating friction of the labia. In cases where the sewing machine does not lead to direct self-excitement, it has been held, as by Fothergill, to predispose to frequency of involuntary sexual orgasm during sleep, from the irritation set up by the movement of the feet in sitting posture during the day. The essential movement in working the sewing machine is the flexion and extension of the ankle, but the muscles of the thighs are used to maintain the feet firmly on the treadle. The thighs are held together, and there is a considerable degree of flexion or extension of the thighs on the trunk. 
by a special adjustment of the body, and sometimes perhaps merely in the presence of sexual hyperesthesia, it is thus possible to act upon the sexual organs. But this is by no means a necessary result of using the sewing machine, and the inquiry of various women, with well-developed sexual feelings who are accustomed to work the treadle, has not shown the presence of any tendency in this direction. Sexual irritation may also be produced by the bicycle in women. Thus, Moll remarks that he knows many married women, and some unmarried, who experience sexual excitement when cycling. In several cases, he has ascertained that the excitement is carried as far as complete orgasm. This result cannot, however, easily happen unless the seat is too high, the peak in contact with the organs, and a rolling movement is adopted. In the absence of marked hyperesthesia, these results are only affected by a bad seat or an improper attitude, the body during cycling resting under proper conditions on the buttocks, and the work being mainly done by the muscles of the thighs and legs which control the ankles, flexions of the thigh on the pelvis being very small. Most medical authorities on cycling are of opinion that when cycling leads to sexual excitement, the fault lies more with the woman than with the machine. The conclusion does not appear to me to be absolutely correct. I find on inquiry that with the old-fashioned saddle, with an elevated peak rising towards the pubes, a certain degree of sexual excitement, not usually producing the orgasm, but, as one lady expressed it, making one feel quite ready for it, is fairly common among women. Lightston finds that irritation of the genital organs may unquestionably be produced in both males and females by cycling. The aggravation of hemorrhoids sometimes produced by cycling indicates also the tendency to local congestion. With improved flat saddles, however, constructed with more definite adjustment to the anatomical formation of the parts, this general tendency is reduced to a negligible minimum. A reference may be made at this point to the influence of tight lacing. This has been recognized by gynecologists as a factor of sexual excitement and a method of masturbation. Women who have never worn corsets sometimes find that on first putting them on, sexual feeling is so intensified that it is necessary to abandon their use. The reason of this, as Siebert points out in his book for El Turn, seems to be that the corset both favors pelvic congestion and at the same time exerts a pressure on the abdominal muscles which brings them into the state produced during coitus. It is doubtless for the same reason, as some women have found, that more distension of the bladder is possible without corsets than with them. End of Autoeroticism, Part 1, Section 1